I think the frustration for most parents is that the diagnosis of ADHD is so random. It just seems so capricious. You go to a doctor or somebody, they ask you a few questions, and they say, yes, your child has ADHD, or no, your child doesn't. And I think that's quite irritating or upsetting for most parents. The problem is that there is not many good evidence that biomarkers, which is what parents would really want, are trustworthy. And I also want to warn parents that you mustn't be duped into thinking that you can do scientific tests to diagnose ADHD when the gold standard to this day still remains a structured interview. I think parents would really have liked it if we had a blood test that could diagnose it because then they would have a sense that the diagnosis has been scientifically made. Unfortunately, there isn't a blood test yet. There are some tests that have to do with EEGs that looked very promising initially, which now don't seem to be that promising anymore, where we thought that they would capture 90% of ADHD children. They're probably only capturing about 40% of ADHD children now. And sometimes we use them to help guide us, but they are not critical to make the diagnosis. There are also some scientific tests that are used in research, which are computer-based tests. But again, they are not specific enough in each child to make a diagnosis. As are PET scans. I do know that parents sometimes travel overseas to have PET scans done for ADHD. And there are some scientists who believe that they can diagnose even different types of ADHD on PET scans. But maybe we're a little bit ahead of ourselves still with these tests. Because even the children that are having PET scans are first screened by the interview and then their data is superimposed on a lot of other data which has also been diagnosed on, on these interviews. And so there really isn't a good scientific, cold, accurate biomarker. Although people are still looking at them. We are at the moment looking at things like attention to sounds, attention to visual, stimuli, distractibility, EEG reporting. There's lots of things going on. But there really isn't a very good test yet. And the majority of people won't have access to it anyway. We live all over the country, and there are not all the many resources around that can do these very specialized tests. But rest assured that the single most important, and this is true internationally still, diagnostic evaluation is sitting with somebody who knows about ADHD and who does a structured interview and asks you a whole lot of questions. Important also with collateral from teachers, Sunday school teachers, therapists, psychologists, and whoever else works with the child, because the more collateral you get, the more scientifically correct your deductions are going to be. But the parents, if they are the ones who are involved with the child, are still the best group of people to ask the questions to. We should also ask the child, but, but the majority of questions we ask the child is actually to exclude other things that look like ADHD rather than to make the diagnosis of ADHD. Because the, the diagnosis is made by history and personally I look to look, like to look at school books because school books tell a story which you know cannot be denied by anybody. So the diagnosis of ADHD rests on two big legs. The one leg has to do with attention, the other leg has to do with hyperactive and impulsive behavior. There are nine identifiable uh, factors on the attention side, and then there's nine on the hyperactive impulsive side. And if you fulfill six of them, chances are you have a diagnosis, either on the attention side or the hyperactive side, of course, and of both. The attention ones are pretty clear about specific symptoms that children have that have, are related to their inability to focus and be distractible. But perhaps I just need to clarify one point, because parents often, when they come to my rooms, don't understand the distinction. To have an attention deficit disorder does not mean that you can't attend. It means you can't attend under certain circumstances. So they cannot attend when it's boring. They cannot attend when it's repeti repetitive. They cannot attend on demand. Well, that's pretty much schoolwork. They don't like to attend if it's labor intensive. But they certainly can attend if they like the topic, or if it's fascinating, 
uh, and, and I mean they, are, they love watching television. In fact, children with ADHD can watch television for hours. It's virtually perfect mnemonic. So it's not like they cannot sit and watch something and concentrate for a long time. It's just that they can't concentrate on things in daily life. And even when they're watching television for a long time, they don't really watch the whole picture. They zone in on isolated incidents rather than seeing the big picture. They love playing with little toys. They love playing with Lego. Most of them love playing sport. They love playing with balls. They like being outside, trampolines. And in those conditions, they can focus fairly well. But it's in the school, in the classroom, where they don't focus so well. And that's why it's important to look at their school books. But how does the attention type issues present itself? Well, first of all, they don't like work that is laborious, especially for attention. And I've already mentioned reading and comprehension tests, which most children with ADHD don't particularly like. They are very easy distractible. And the problem with ADHD children is not that they're distractible, because we are all distractible. In fact, we should be distractible, is that they can't help themselves or stop themselves from being distractible. So they can be distracted continuously, even when it's not in their best interests. Um, they lose things, they, they, they lose their possessions, they don't, they're always looking for their cell phone, their blazer, their shoes. You are always spending a lot of money. They go to school with a full case of pencils and rulers and all that kind of stuff, and the first day they come home, half of it's gone. They don't know where it is, they think somebody stole it, they have no idea what's going on. So that is, they are totally disorganized, and the disorganization is one of those symptoms that gets worse as you get older. So adolescence, that's the hallmark of ADHD, is total material chaos. Uh, they cannot be organized, they lose things, they're never in time for assignments, they don't know what's going on, they've never studied for the test because they didn't know there was a test. So all of these types of things are symptoms. They can't get ready in the morning for school, they're disorganized, you have to nag them, they daydream, they put on one sock, then they forget about the other sock. If you don't tell them to move on, they're watching television again, they forget to brush their teeth. You have to tell them the same things every single day. Why? Because it's boring. So every day you have to say brush your teeth, every day you have to say comb your hair, every day you have to say if you've taken your suitcase, have you packed your bags, have you... So this is the kind of hallmarks of the attention deficit. And it is very very exhausting. The second part is the hyperactive part and again children with ADHD are not children necessarily who run around like crazy people or certainly I've had patients run up my walls but this is not common. The majority of them just cannot sit still. It looks as if the seat is actually hurting them. They fidgety and squirmy in the classroom and often will stand up walk around without uh, asking for permission they're always wanting to help other children in the class, even when they themselves are not coping. Um, they're interfering with other children in the classroom. They talk a lot, and that brings me to the, one of the symptoms, is that talkativeness is also a hyperactive behavior. Um, bright children talk a lot too, uh, but they usually have something to say. ADHD children talk a lot, but you're never quite sure what they're getting at. Uh, they get bogged down by detail, by facts. They sometimes get themselves into a mess. They don't know how to get out of a story. They sometimes will just stop talking and you know, raise their shoulders and walk away in disgust because they have no idea what they were saying. They may start off with Superman, end up with Batman, and have no idea how they change the topic in between. And when you listen to them, it can be quite exhausting. They are also extremely concrete. When you ask a question, they give an answer that doesn't always seem to be relevant to the question. Sometimes it's very concrete, sometimes it's tangential. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with what you're actually asking. I once asked a girl what she likes to do at school and she just screamed. And then I wasn't sure what she was getting at and I said, what is that? She says, I sing choir. So this was her version of singing. So you, they, they have a strange way of answering questions and speaking and that is part of the hyperactive behavior. And then lastly is the impulsive behavior. They cannot wait their turn and in class, this often presents itself with children shouting out answers. And the brighter the ADHD, the bigger this problem is uh, in your classroom, that these children are socially very impulsive. Uh, again, they may lash out at children very impulsively, walk past somebody and just hit them or bump them. They cannot wait their turn. Many children with ADHD can't play cricket because they can't wait to bat. Um, they like to be in there and just, you know, run people off the ground like in rugby, but they can't really play cricket. Even tennis can be a challenge for some of them. 
They don't do well in contact sport generally because they are so impulsive and can sometimes be bullied or be bullies because of this very impulsive behavior. They will shout out answers to questions they don't even understand or sometimes haven't heard the whole question. So these are the type of symptoms that we are trying to elicit when we are talking to parents in a very structured interview. While we're going through the interview, I'm actually in my head ticking the boxes of all of these various 18 features of your child by asking indirect questions. And as you talk to me, I can realize, is this a major problem? Is it a minor problem? Or is it not a problem? And in the end, one can look and see if there's at least six or 12 of these symptoms that you can use to diagnose ADHD. Of course, we ask a lot of other questions about social issues, aggression, emotionality, not being able to postpone. These support the diagnosis, but they are not part of the diagnosis. But they are important when we talk about how to manage the child. In the past, we used to differentiate between children who had only had attention deficit and children who were only hyperactive and children who had everything. But in the new classification, everything is called ADHD. We can say you have ADHD predominantly inattentive or ADHD predominantly hyperactive or ADHD predominantly combined, but they are all called ADHD. So the old expression of using ADD is now no more used. Everybody has now got ADHD. And the reason for that is that children at different times in their lives have different symptoms and can cross the borders. And it is probably not very useful to keep them in boxes. Ones that are very hyperactive often present already at the age of four. They're the ones who are climbing over the burglar proofing, climbing over the walls already. They are the climbers and they present very early. Um, they are usually quite emotional, aggressive and trying children. The children with a combined group often present in preschool because they are the ones who are not school ready. They have language issues, they have fine motor issues, they have visual motor aggression issues and also emotional um, immaturity. And we often diagnose them at five, five and a half before they go to school. That's when they used to have to get start with therapy usually. That's usually when we start with medication as well. And then we have the dreamers and they are the worst off of all of these children. They often only diagnose between nine and 14 years of age. They are not spotted. They're mostly girls, very low toned, often overweight girls, not popular, socially inept, very introvert. People just think they're dumb or that they are just misfits, but they are actually battling with enormous attention deficit. And if we don't diagnose them and treat them, they also have the highest rate of depression and suicide of all the ADHD children. We don't like to diagnose ADHD before the age of five. And the reason for that is between three and four, all children present with ADHD, basically. They are all egocentric, hyperactive, busy, impulsive, and with uh, children with very short attention span. If they have added developmental delay in any field, we have to sit up and be a bit more concerned. There are, of course, children that have severe behavior problems. Uh, I have, the youngest I've seen is an 18-month-old child who stabbed her mother, but it can really start at a very young age. And these children we don't like to diagnose early. They could be many different diagnoses, but often have ADHD as part of their diagnoses. We treat them with medication, but with different medications than we use for ADHD. And we often don't label them ADHD until they're older. We like to make a diagnosis, confirming diagnosis. By the age of five, we are pretty sure that we are dealing with ADHD. But by from four and a half, we can start playing with a diagnosis. An interesting new fact is that many children with ADHD start off looking a little bit autistic. And so one often at two to three thinks that these children are actually going to be autistic, especially with language delay, and then they eventually turn out to be ADHD. The converse is also true. Children start off looking like ADHD at a very young age, and by two years old, they are obviously autistic. So one mustn't label children too young. I think under the age of four, it's a very fluid time in children's development, and one must intervene where intervention is necessary but don't make diagnoses or label children too young.